Welcome, everyone. I'm Xerxes Spencer, Manager of Fellowship Programs here at the National Endowment for Democracy. On behalf of NED's International Forum for Democratic Studies, I'm pleased to welcome everyone to today's presentation, Preparing a New Generation of Women Leaders in Zimbabwe, featuring Reagan Fussell Democracy Fellow, Nirazo Masha Yamombe. We're delighted to have with us as discussant today, Natalie Kay, Assistant Program Officer for Southern Africa here at NED. As many of you may know, the Reagan Fussell Democracy Fellows Program is an international exchange program funded by the US Congress to host some of the world's most dedicated democracy activists, scholars, and journalists who conduct independent research and outreach here at NED. Now in our 15th anniversary year, we have hosted more than 250 fellows from over 90 countries since our founding in 2001. Within this remarkable group, our speaker today stands out for her unwavering commitment to the empowerment of girls and young women in Zimbabwe. In 2018, Zimbabweans will take to the polls in their country's next general election. Although elections are widely viewed as a cornerstone of democracy, they have not traditionally given Zimbabwean women a public voice. Even though they comprise 50% of the youth population, girls and young women experience poverty, violence, and political exclusion out of proportion to their numbers. Opportunities for women's participation and leadership, whether in politics, business, civil society, or beyond, would go a long way towards improving their quality of life and ensuring that decisions made take their needs into account. In her presentation, Nearadzo, whom we also like to refer to as Neari, will discuss the state of young women's political participation and offer recommendations for promoting gender equality and democratization in Zimbabwe. Niari is founding director of Tag a Life International, a Harare-based organization that promotes the human rights of girls and young women. She's an outgoing board member of the Women's Coalition of Zimbabwe, and perhaps most notably, an accomplished singer and songwriter. More of that in a moment. During her fellowship, she is examining best practices for empowering women and girls to become more active members of the movement for democracy in Zimbabwe. Natalie Kay, our discussant today, is Assistant Program Officer for Africa at the National Endowment for Democracy, in which capacity she manages NED's grants portfolio in Southern Africa and Rwanda. A few notes before we proceed. For those of you on Twitter, you can follow this event and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NEDEvents, the forum at Think Democracy, the endowment at NE Democracy, or by tagging Niari Mash. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And finally, let me take this opportunity to thank the many staff members involved with today's event, most especially research associate, Esha Hill. And now let me turn the floor over to Neari, who has in store for us not only her remarks, but also, first and foremost, a short music video from her most recent album, which explores some of the themes that she will be speaking about in her presentation. Neari, thank you. Our children are suffering Our daughters are crying They are suffering under the head of people Crying under the head of some men They lose their lives under the head 
Asia. Thank you all for coming. The video that you've just seen is, uh, the song was written and composed by yours truly. And I feature a significant artist from Zimbabwe called Chioni Somarairi. Unfortunately, she's no longer with us. But uh, I want to start by thanking thanking all of you for coming today, uh, for leaving all your important uh, jobs and things that you could have been doing uh, to be with me here. Uh, I also want to thank, sorry, I would also want to thank, uh, to thank the girls of Zimbabwe, the young women who have allowed me to be in this position that I work for um, with Tali, my organization. I'd like to thank um, the board of directors at uh, NED for investing in democracy across the world. I want to thank um, Carl Gashman for believing in the, um, again, in democracy and making sure that um, us Democrats get the opportunity to come and learn about democracy. I'd like to thank Sally Blair for your amazing directorship on this program to make sure that us fellows um, well looked after and are settling in in our learning. I want to thank Zach Spencer for managing this program and making sure that us fellows again um, settled and are learning as much as we can. I'd like to thank the Greater African team at NED. Um, specifically, um, I'd like to thank uh, Dave Peterson, who is in absentia today. I want to thank Eric Robinson. I want to thank Natalie Kay, who are all part of the African team. I want to thank my fellow, uh, my colleagues who are fellows here, who make it um, home away from home. I want to thank Megan, uh, Megan Corum for making sure that administratively I'm settled here at the NED. I also want to thank Ian for, for the support. But I want to thank also um, Emily Mason for being an amazing uh, research associate for my first two months here at NED. And last but not least, I want to thank Asha Hill for the fantastic job that she put in, the hours that we both put in to come up with this presentation today. Um, to kickstart my presentation today, I just want to take you through what to expect um, so that you kind of know what's going to happen. I'm going to share with you my story growing up in Zimbabwe, in rural Zimbabwe to be specific. Um, that kind of will give you a snapshot of what it is like for a girl or young woman to grow up in Zimbabwe. I'm going to talk about barriers uh, to women's participation. I will also talk about why it is important to invest in girls and young women participation. I'll share with you my work with Tega Life International Trust, TALI, the organization, again, that I work for. I will take you through the challenges that the civic society experiences in Zimbabwe. I will end with my recommendations for different stakeholders. Now, before I get into my story, I just want you to kind of be thinking about the questions that I'll attempt to answer today. One of them being, why it is, uh, what is the situation regarding young women's leadership in political participation in Zimbabwe? Why invest in young women in the first place? What benefit is it to democracy around the world? Why it is the right and moral thing to do? What can we do to enhance leadership and, uh, uh, le leadership and political participation of girls and young women in Zimbabwe? But first of all, I will, as I mentioned, I'm going to share with you my growing up in Zimbabwe. So in this picture, you'll see my mother here. She was very young. Now she's a little bit older than this. And you'll see yours truly here. I was around 13, 14 years old in Zimbabwe. And my dearest nephew, Donald, um, who I grew up with, who thought, uh, whom we thought was my young brother because he was looked after by my mom. But my mother single-handedly raised us uh, the, the eight of us, I'm the last born, and my father died when my mother was six months pregnant carrying me. That means that she had to bring us all up uh, alone as a single parent. We were orphaned. But uh, the story that you hear today is not just about orphanhood, but it's also about the poor in Zimbabwe. But it, it also is about those people who have both parents but are still going through the same difficulties and 
um, making it difficult for them to participate and to meaning, meaningfully contribute to the development of Zimbabwe. So growing up, um, living in rural communities meant that I had to travel more than four miles to school and four miles back. That's about uh, plus or minus eight miles to school in a day. And um, so that meant that education was difficult to access. And then um, also growing up in Zimbabwe, what would, trigger you, what, what would interest you is that we like to call it, it takes a village to raise a child. Though I was raised, raised by a single mother, I also had extended family uh, around me that included my aunts, my, um, my uncles, my brothers, my, sis my, my cousin brothers and sisters around me. But also not only that is that not only does that give you a village around you, it can also pose a threat around a girl child who raises, uh, who is raised up in Zimbabwe because we know that 74% of girls and young women who go through rape are raped by the people they know. That includes their own fathers, their own uncles, uh, their neighbors, the people that they know. So I'm going to share with you about four stories growing up uh, in Zimbabwe. Um, First of all, I will share with you the story of Rudo's child marriage. So in Zimbabwe, more than 33% of young women get married before their, uh, their 18th birthday, um, or they have their first child before they are 18, they are 18 years old. And so Rudo was my friend that I, that I traveled to school with. She stayed about a, a house or two away from, from my rural home. We traveled to school together and back together. We sat at the, at the same desk in school. and. Um, Rudo sometimes came to school and sometimes she didn't. And I remember at one particular point I asked uh, Rudo why she didn't come. Sometimes she wouldn't be at school for two, three weeks. And she just didn't answer me. She didn't have a straight answer for me. And at some point I met Rudo's uh, mother who also was a f kind of a distant friend to my mother. And I asked her why, doesn't her, why didn't her daughter come to school almost every day, uh, missing sometimes a month or so in school. And she just brushed me aside. Years later, I learned that Rudo, because they went to this apostolic church, Rudo had been married young, and so she didn't, uh, she didn't finish her school. And then I'll tell you about, I like this picture because we took it uh, th uh, in one of our programs. By the way, these are my, my older brothers. So the picture that you're going to see here um, is of girls, uh, girls and boys at a school that I went to called Rusunungoko. So. I've titled this story Pretty Girls at School. So Pretty Girls at School were those girls who, were, who could afford a proper uniform, who could a pro uh, afford a, a presentable uniform that they could wear. That meant that they would be a little bit more attractive to teachers. And so teachers would approach those girls, fall in love with them, um, have relationships with them, even, even though the teachers were married and had their um, their wives in urban cities because sometimes they would be married to fellow teachers and uh, you know other progressive uh, other mature women but they would still prey on the young women and um, so I was one of the I could have been one of the victims because when I was in form two form three my my geography teacher wrote a, a love letter and put it in my geography book and when I saw it I I knew that two things were going to happen. One, one thing was going to be that I would report this case to the school head, and I was afraid for the drama that it would bring, because in also growing up uh, in, my, in my country, and probably this is synonymous with uh, Southern Africa, or probably across the world, uh, that when a young woman gets raped, or gets sexually assaulted, or any inf uh, anything unfortunate happens to them, the question often is, what did you do to attract that? So in that moment when I was in Form 3, when I saw this letter, I thought that if I, t I, if I took it to the school head, it was going to be drama. The, my mother was going to be invited into this whole scenario, and she was going to ask the, the difficult question to say, what did you do to invite this upon yourself? And then the second option was to keep quiet. But keeping quiet meant that I would accepted uh, this relationship from my teacher, and it also meant that it was a threat to my future. I was going to end up like all these pretty girls that I'd seen that they would, um, they would lose um, their education, they would fall pregnant, and their future cut. But I don't know, I just remember shaking, going to the school head with, a, with that book in my hand. And I, I went, because you have to understand that in Zimbabwe, then I think things have a little bit changed now. 
during our time, a school authority was such an authority that she had to be feared. So I remember just shaking, taking the, uh, the book to the school head, and then the school head just, I told him the story, and I said, I found this in my book, and he grabbed it from me, and he, he, he just indicated that I had to leave the office. And I left the office, I went to class, I was afraid that my teacher would... Um, victimize me, but that didn't happen. But first trick, about 15 years later, when I went to launch Tali in, in this school, um, I remember when I was still in Guer, one of the cities away from my school, I called the, the teachers in at the school because I was also bringing, I was hosting the U.S. ambassador, the, the, uh, then Charles, Charles Ray, and he was coming to be our guest as I was launching the project at my school. So I asked the, the team at the school, the teachers that we were working with, to say, hey, get an MC because I wanted them to own the program. And they said, ah, don't worry, we have an MC. But to cut the long story short, when I got there, the teacher happens to be my former geographer teacher who actually then testified that I had started activism when I was still at school because uh, he I, he had written me a love letter and I and I taken it to the school head. I had completely forgotten about that story, but him testifying before everyone and on record uh, was just amazing for me to just feel that sometimes it's difficult being in school. Uh, the difficult decision that I had to make, and I also dis I, I also was thinking that. How many of us could have had that, could have been able to go and report to the, uh, to the school head? But to quickly talk about the diary, this word that you see is diary, not there. Um, <laughs> the exclusion from diary. There is a village, com uh, the village community or the village court in Zimbabwe. So what happens at the Dare is that they are the, the Dare is the one that presides over cases within a community, um, be it issues of theft within a community, be it issues of young women uh, being married young and the, probably the village or the chief deciding that, well, for, for, for a man who harasses or sexually assaults a child, we are going to have you give us a, a cow or, um, or a goat and then get married. So I do remember that only men and the young men actually went to this platform and i remember just getting updates from my young uh, from my cousin brother but i it, it 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 i raised it within myself to say why is it that we are not part of this process and yet it's a significant part of our livelihoods as young women in zimbabwe and then the last story that i'll share with you about my my growing up is um the issue of siblings career choice for me so when i finished my education i i, I passed with uh with moderate, I can't say I was, I passed with flying colors because the conditions were just tough. Um, and hence my other passion for education in rural communities. But I managed to pass to cross over to, to my next, um, to my next stage. And my siblings were very supportive and supportive of my mother. So when I passed, I, 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 I left the village and I went to, to stay with my sister, the one that you see here. And they, I remember my siblings gathering on a Saturday to say, oh, she has passed, so what is she going to do next? And I remember my, one of my brothers saying, well, let her do a marketing uh, degree or program. And then the same brother decided to say, well, well, because she is a woman, we can't have her do a marketing degree or program because pretty soon she will get married. Uh, and um, marketing uh, means traveling a lot, so that may not be good for her. But guess what? I'm not married years after. But <laughs> so I went, um, so they, they, they recommended that I did secretarials. I was so excited. I just didn't know. I didn't have a clue of what was going on. But I, what I know is I was excited that finally I was doing something to progress my life. So what, uh, what you see is me at one of the secretarial programs because my siblings made me do secretarial studies. But when I was working in one of the parastatals in Zimbabwe, I was very lucky as, as my second job, I got a job within a parastatal. I was working with engineers and electricians who reminded us, the secretaries, every day that we were not educated, that um, we needed to get a life, that we were nothing. And I, felt, I kind of felt like the arrogance was too much and it pushed me to do something about my life. And I remember that was around 2002, 2003, and that was the very difficult time in Zimbabwe. But I decided to correspond with a South, South African institution to start my degree. It took me close to eight or nine years to finish that degree because it was very expensive. But this is me graduating for my first degree with my sister. Um, when I sent myself to school, I went on to do my master's degree in development and other diplomas to develop myself um, uh, in terms of career. So now I'll, I'll take you through the 
I, I've just shared with you my story growing up in Zimbabwe and kind of try to give you the snapshot of what it looks like for a young woman. By no means am I representing all the population in Zimbabwe because Zimbabwe is a, is a diverse community. Some people are, even within the rural communities, they're poor while living a little bit well, but they're also, majority are in poverty, but also that um, there are many dynamics, and also the stories that I shared could be worse for a person who's staying in Rob, in I mean in Eben, Zimbabwe. I could probably have had it better. Other people may be having it worse in 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 Eben, Zimbabwe. So just to give you that um, that caution. So um, I'm going to talk about barriers to participation for girls and young women in Zimbabwe. Men are still overwhelmingly decision makers in Zimbabwe. Um, the the judiciary, the legislature. Uh, the cabinet board, uh, the cabinet board, executives of corporations, private sector, public sector, media boards, um, and executives, negotiators, influencers, the civic society where a lot where you'd you'd uh, find a lot of money is often led by the men as well. So. One of the key issues that has caused that scenario to stay is the issue of education. I mentioned earlier on how difficult it is for a girl to access education. And some parents are not empowered to even know that they want to, they have to fight for the education of their children. Sometimes because of circumstances and situations beyond their control, they simply can't afford uh, their children to school. So in this picture, you also see this beautiful girl uh, and these women. This is a church, usually it's one of the apostolic sects. Some of them are progressive, some of them are not very progressive. Um, so this is a picture that I got online that evidently was used by another organization to, to campaign for birth, con uh, for, it says a safe birth for every apostolic woman. So usually this apostolic sex is a religion in Zimbabwe that is notorious usually for not sending children to school, for refusing them um, health um, health care and their women. So. The issue of education is a, is, is a difficult uh, matter in Zimbabwe. The issue of negative cultural and religious practices, I, I shared the issue, uh, the story of, uh, of Rudo, my friend, that I grew up with. But also the issue of, um, the, the issue of gender roles, we know that women and girls have alluded with other, responsibility, other respons responsibilities other than them trying to focus on their own development. We have the issues of religion and culture, that negative religious and cultural practices that affect girls and young women. And then the second um, issue that I'll talk about is the issue of a patriarchal system that excludes women. So in this picture, you see that this is the, uh, the current presidium in Zimbabwe. Uh, at the center is President Robert Mugabe. Uh, to his left is the first vice president, um, uh, president Mnang uh, Vice President Mnangagwa. And to his right, the second vice president, Mpoko. Um, so this picture should actually worry us, especially looking at the fact that we're talking about today, participation of leadership of women and girls in Zimbabwe. We know that at this, at this position, uh, a few years ago, was a, a female, Comrade Joyce Mujuru, um, who got, who, who, who was ceremonious, ceremoniously dismissed from a position for reasons known to the uh, ruling party and others, which I will not get into. But what worries me is just this picture to say when we, ref we remove a woman here, it should have worried us to say we can't, rem we can't replace her with another man. And so following to that is the issue of tokenism. We know that in the constitution, for those who follow Zimbabwe, the constitution of Zimbabwe allowed uh, for, for a quota that says 60% of women, 60 seats are allocated to women. And that would be allocated according to how the political parties would have performed in an election. And while this is a welcome uh, initiative by the government of Zimbabwe, of, by the people of Zimbabwe within the constitution, we know that even even so, the women who are going to come within the 60% are going to be seconded from their political parties. And who is in control at the political parties is the males. Who, we had uh, uh, lamentations and, I mean, complaints that were like the women that were seconded to, to these positions are either girlfriends or, you know, people that are easily, not necessarily people that are objective would move the principles or 
uh, the, the progress of the country or development, but people who can just actually be placeholders. So it poses, while we appreciate uh, quotas, it still goes on to say that we still have a lot of uh, control, men still continue controlling uh, in all spaces. And also the issue of uh, poverty and economic exclusion of women. We know in Zimbabwe that and majority of Southern Africa that uh, the poverty wears the, fa the face of a woman and a wom uh, and, and young women because women at the end of the day cannot dump their families or can uh, cannot give up on their families. They are always the ones who are going to suffer. But they are excluded from opportunities of education to improve their own lives as well. So poverty um, makes women unable to, to participate and actually makes them more oppressed because the people who are holding these opportunities are the men. So they have to go to the men and get opportunities again. And so in Zimbabwe, we do have an, an economic meltdown. An economic meltdown, it sadly affects women and takes away their opportunities uh, in terms of econom economic opportunities. And then the issues of access to land and mining. You, we, uh, we see in this picture that it's a woman who is uh, in, this field, uh, in this field. Chances are that she's a worker. She's hardly the owner of this field. And so we know that th that's true in mining as well. Um, in mining as well as other opportunities. And we do also know that women, especially young women, are exposed to menial jobs such as child prostitution to be able to, to want to survive. So that continues excluding them. We do have another uh, issue that is um, one of the burning issues right now in Zimbabwe. For those that may be following, there has been a recent shutdown Zimbabwe uh, protests or demonstrations which occurred yesterday where people, the citizens of Zimbabwe decided that enough was enough. We've, we've had enough of the corruption and bad governance and the difficulties that are going on in our country. For instance, the president uh, sometime this year um, actually came out uh, public and said that more than $15 billion, more than 15 billion United States dollars was missing and that couldn't be accounted for. And this money, we know it could have helped women um, to, to get a better education for their children, better lives. It would have resuscitated industry that has since collapsed in Zimbabwe. This money could have, by the way, Zimbabwe has a population of 14 million. So I think after this, we had uh, some young Zimbabweans go online and say every person could have gotten a thousand, and a thousand would have gone a long way if that $15 billion would have been well utilized. But we do know that this is just a scratch of the, the surface. For a president to admit now that $15 billion is missing, they surely is more that could have been missing. I mean, we've, we had been talking about corruption and the government has, hadn't been ag admitting that we do have corruption. So we do have also public officers um, who have been abusing uh, uh, their offices to, to enrich themselves and their personal friends. For instance, we do have um, parastatal heads like currently the, um, the issue of tenders being awarded, um, you know, without following procedures. That is corruption already, and we know that a few are benefiting out of it, and it's actually a, a, a negative impact on the economic performance of, of the country. We, we also, one of the key issues that has uh, crippled Zimbabwe is the, key, the issue of lack of transparency in policy implementation. One of the key issues that had caused uh, Zimbabweans to protest is the imposition of an imports ban. We know 85% of Zimbabweans are not employed or probably 90%. And these people are surviving on informal trade. And that included cross-border trading with South Africa, Botswana, and other people. And recently, the government just uh, introduced an import ban to say nobody can can be able to bring in uh, imports from another country. What does that that look like for a for a standard Zimbabwean who's been um, surviving on imports or on on, uh, on cross border trading since the country is not performing and there's no industry to talk about? It means that there's more oppression and it means that uh, many people are going to have to depend on the few. So when they're including when, when they are introducing um, policy, uh, policies such as imports ban, it means that, again, we are going to see the politicians, those who have access, who've always had control, having this control, and they have already businesses that are thriving. And it means that opportunities are still going to continue, and the livelihoods of people are actually affected badly. 
So we've seen that also in with, uh, through the labor, uh, the labor bill that was introduced where many people lost their jobs without compensation and the looming bond notes and the government has been threatening to in introduce uh, the, the, the bond notes which people are, are, are not happy about. People are, are not happy. They, they are afraid that we'll go back to the, uh, to the economic performance that happened uh, around 2007-2008 where inflation was skyrocketing. Um, one of the issues that has become a barrier for young people, especially, is the issue of an uh, inaccessibility of technology. I applied on this platform to be at NED through because I saw this opportunity online because I had internet access, and it gave me an opportunity to see the world. But many Zimbabweans who are working in rural communities or even who are just living in rural communities do not have internet. But at the flip of it is a, a generation of young, of young urbanites who do have internet at their fingertips like with smartphones, but they're misusing it uh, through, um, in relationships for instance, young women are often under the pressure to record themselves um, nude pictures and sometimes their boyfriends record um, they, they do record without their knowledge um, videos of, of, of their sexual activities, which often are released at the point of, of, of a, a relation breaking down. So it again comes back to the young women. Backlash always comes back to the young women. And to quickly run us through to some of the um, barriers, the issue of violence against girls and young women, this can be during or during elections or after elections, issues of rape and, and just the sometimes the violence that can prevail in such circumstances, the issues of women's health, lack of commitment to gender equality by the government, as I showed that sometimes we, we witness, especially in significant positions, the issue of tokenism, the issue of leadership training and mentorship where we would appreciate more of uh, investment being put towards the um, um, grooming and training young women for, for leadership, lack of cross-cutting gender equality enforcement and monitoring uh, in the private and public sectors as well to just ensure accountability across the board. Now, I'm going to talk about having, having, uh, having gone through my own life story, the barriers uh, to young women participation, I'm going to talk about why it is important for us to invest in girls and young women participation in Zimbabwe and Africa at large. So, first of all, it is a moral issue. If men are being given the opportunities Girls should be given the same opportunities too because they are human beings. When we invest in girls and young women participation at a young age, it means that we are investing in global democracy and development. So we also invest in young women because it advances social and cultural development of our countries. Uh, it enhances economic growth for any country or any nation. When women and girls are empowered to take part in, in, in position of leadership and participation and just um, contributing to their own communities in their own homes, it means that we can actually have better governance, better peace building. Um, we can have women uh, engaging in conflict uh, prevention and resolution. Uh, we can have enhanced accountability and better governance. As I said, 50, more than 50% of the voters are women. Usually they vote at an older age. They go and vote, but most of the time they are doing that from a non, uh, advice, non, uh, from a lack of knowledge point of view. They are not sure why they appoint public officers. In the past, we've seen that women are usually just utilized as mobs that uh, just go and increase the numbers of politicians. But if young women and girls are groomed at a young age, they, be, they grow to be, but you know, educated and informed citizens who actually then appoint leaders and they themselves can be appointed to be leaders. And then they also can contribute to global development. Having said this, I'm going to take you through uh, the work that I do with my organization. Now, I've been talking, talking, talking. Um, I want to believe that I'm engaging, that nobody's sleeping, but <laughs> I'm just going to take you through. I want us to all recite our mission as an organization. As I mentioned, the nonprofit that I run is called Tege Life International Trust, Tali. Um, I started it in, 20, in 2010, so that means we're in our sixth year. So now, I want you to join me, uh, recite, can we all read? 
it's a place for the girl child. Thank you. You want to do that again? <laughs> the world is a place for the girl child. Thank you. As an organization, we envision a safe world where girls are free to dream, empowered to become. Um, where girls are free to dream, empowered to become whoever they want to be. A world where girls um, can make social and economic choices free without negative influences from others, but rather with the community support. We envision a world where girls are treated, where, sorry, we envision a world where girls and boys are treated equally in every aspect of their life, a world where children will be allowed to be children enjoying their equal right. And so as an organization, we operate with, within three pillars. We want to first of all prevent all exclusion for girls. Uh, that, is, uh, that pillar looks at um, the, the interventions part of our work. And then the second pillar is interventions. And then the third pillar is advocacy. But with our, with our prevention pillar, when, when I started this organization, I was thinking that no girl should be left out. Therefore we would look at girls and, um, and train them so that they are young women who are able to articulate their issues, who are able to defend their own rights, who are able to take part within processes within their homes, their communities, their nation, and within the global uh, situation. So we, we train the girls, we give them life skills, we build them confidence so that they are able to participate. We also partner with government ministries in our country because without the government, uh, we do recognize that the work that we do is primarily the responsibility of the government. Government. So usually we we know also that uh, the mother ministry for our work is the Ministry of Women Affairs, Gender and Community Development, which we've we, we've been working with well in the past, and so we develop leaders, um, as I mentioned, so that they're able to participate as empowered citizens. But not only do we craft and focus our work around. Uh, just developing the girl child. We know that the girls don't live in a vacuum. They live within communities. So we, we also have programs that target the boys, the men, the communities, the local leaders, addressing negative religious and cultural practices that exclude the girls from the tables. S issues such as sexual reproductive health rights, gender inequalities, HIV prevention and management. Um, we address issues of child marriages. We promote education. And also, as you saw in the, in, in the previous um, in the, before I presented my video, we use the arts and the culture to make sure that our voices are heard where they're supposed to be heard. And so in, um, to this, we have uh, trained more than 76 schools uh, who are running our empowerment clubs. We work with more than 500 community educators that, con that includes men and women. We've reached uh, and trained more than 500 youth advocates. Uh, we've disseminated and documented our work and we participate within the national and international uh, platforms. In our interventions, um, it's basically to provide uh, services, psychosocial services to survivors of rape. For instance, in this picture, you see a grandmother of a young woman who was raped and subsequently killed in 2010, whom we've been working with uh, over the last years, making sure that she's supported at court and she, she, she is provided with the support that she needs. And in this picture, you'll see that, you read that the, uh, this, uh, it's a text that I received last week that says uh, the young girl that, all, that old man forced to marry last year when she was in grade five passed away yesterday trying to give birth. So these are some of the issues that are happening. And as an organization, we always are trying to say before it happens, we want to help the families. But also, we operate within the advocacy where we are saying that um, we advocate to uh, to policymakers, we work with policymakers, uh, we work with the religious uh, leaders and cultural leaders with, and journalists to make sure that um, our voice is ahead and we run an advocacy platform with different stakeholders. Entali does not operate in a vacuum. As I mentioned earlier, we are a member of Women's Coalition of Zimbabwe, the, the women's movement that comes together to make sure that we work with the ministries, with, with anybody, to make sure that the rights, and, uh, the rights of women and young women are taken care of. And we also operate within the global space where we are part of the glo uh, platforms such as the Girls Not Brides, where we were, um, um, uh, we were the coordinating, where I was coordinating um, for about three years for the Zimbabwean chapter. 
And so I'm just going to run us through the, the challenges within the civic society, which we already know maybe some of them, uh, and just say the current economic meltdown has not spared the civic society. It's, it's a reality that kind of is a backlash to what we are trying to do. The political unstable environment has been, has been hard as well for the civic society. Gender-based funding imbalances, for instance, most of the money you find that a lot of money is within the male-led organizations, so that kind of um, affects the women as well. And even access to communities is another issue because of sometimes the unstable political environment. Sometimes you're allowed to get into the community by the, by the government, sometimes you're not. Uh, lack of sustainable funding for civic society. And um, as an organization and many others, we work with youth who are very mobile. So sometimes you're training them today and they wake up and they got an opportunity somewhere. So just tracking them sometimes can be a challenge. And then we do have in our communities the donor mentality syndrome where, yes, we work with the communities. You're training the communities to, to be able to include them at planning and all these processes so that there's an organic um, ownership and uh, progress once the, the money is gone. But sometimes communities are expecting you to continue coming to, to, to do programs with them, but they forget that these programs are funded. And sometimes when the funding is, is gone, it, it becomes uh, difficult. But I'll, I'll, in my, the ending of my presentation, I want to just come up with some recommendations for different stakeholders. For the Zimbabwean government, um, I would recommend that we provide free, quality, and accessible education for our girls and young women as stipulated in the Constitution. To increase funding for girls and young women participation, for instance, the, the, women's, uh, the Ministry of Women Affairs, Gender, and Community Development is the least funded in the country. So we need the government to pay attention uh, to that because it, it is an indication of whether the government is committed to women, uh, to women and girls' empowerment and equality or not. Committing to gender equality in private and public sectors, putting together, putting in place structures to monitor and to evaluate the progress of the country. To enforce laws against negative religious and cultural practice, for instance, the Constitution provides for it, but they, there seems to be lack of political will to make sure that that is reduced into a law that can help people to, to benefit from it, ensure that non partisan economic opportunities to all. For instance, um, sometimes it's difficult for people who are not within the, uh, the political space to get opportunities and largely going to sometimes the ruling party. So just making sure that structures are there to save the citizens, not political, uh, political structures. To ensure immediate arrest and sentencing of perpetrators of corruption, especially for public officers. We spoke about the $15 billion and the, uh, and the parastatal leaders who are flouting tenders and nothing has been done. But we see a lot of the heavy hand of the law against um, poor, powerless, uh, uh, poor, powerless citizen, uh, citizens who are trying to survive. So we recommend that the values of democracy and constitutionalism is... Exp is, is um, is exercised especially in creating policy. For instance, the import ban was just something that I'm sure was crafted in private and then imposed on people instead of coming to the people and inquiring and including people in the processes. And then the civic society in Zimbabwe, I recommend that um, we promote early public life uh, engagement uh, for girls. We promote gender equality in democracy and human rights programming. To, uh, we advocate for increased gender funding that's within the government and um, within the international community to, uh, to articulate women's rights within the political sphere. So for instance, also probably one of the reasons is that women, usually we exclude women's movement, we exclude the, um, the issues of women and girls from the mainline politics and we forget that they, everything that we're doing is political so we need to plug ourselves in, uh, in when we're doing our work. Um, to strengthen national and in international partnerships to continue to encourage transformational leadership for female leaders to support each other. We know that every, every, uh, environment, every movement has its challenges when they are big, but we do hope that the, the leadership in, within a movement such as the women's movement in Zimbabwe is able to to bring everybody on board to respond to all issues in spite of whether you like somebody or not or things like that. Then uh, to the international community that we, that we represent here, we recommend that 
uh, if we could engage civic society in designing and planning activities. So often we get call for proposals and usually it's as aligned with big funds, big uh, monies, millions of dollars, and then somebody maybe um, here in Washington or elsewhere uh, uh, set down and design programs without the, the input of the people on the ground. And by this I mean that even including these people who are f in the, uh, in the, um, within the grassroots, sometimes we also see, sometimes us, the affluent, being part of the, uh, the, the, the boards here, but I want to encourage the, um, the international community to get into the communities uh, get people who are working within the communities to input into our programming because it means that we are, we are increasing their voices. They are the ones who know what they need so that our money and our resources are directed to meet the actual needs that we need to address. Uh, to invest in young women's leadership, uh, to invest in girls' education, to increase opportunities for girls in regional and international uh, platforms, to strive for, for uh, flexible donor partner relationships. Um, this is for some organizations, sometimes um, international organizations, in a, an environment like Zimbabwe, which is politically volatile, requires flexible relationships, especially with the local partners, the, uh, the, the civic society. So sometimes issues like insisting on wanting to go on the ground to a community when the government is saying no could actually ruin the, uh, the relationship for the organization and the government. So it, it helps if we can negotiate um, our our relationships to be flexible so that at the end of the day there is increased accountability of course within us, the civic society, to explore other methods of accountability but at the same time assisting each other and being empathetic within the, the, democratic, uh, the democratic spheres that we have to operate within. And then to, uh, to engage government in pro, um, in, in pro poor pro social justice uh, Reforms, for instance, this, uh, the uh, IMF is reengaging the government of Zimbabwe now, and they're introducing recommendations to the government in terms of policy. And we do feel, I, I as a person, I've been um, monitoring the goings on in Zimbabwe, and we, there's kind of a feeling that the, the government of Zimbabwe, most of these reforms that are, they are doing, they're trying to meet the requirements for the for the recently engaging IMF and the other world uh, global. Uh, funders, and I want to say that this is good to engage, but we also want, I uh, would want to appeal to the international community to ensure the, um, to ensure pro-democracy uh, engagement with government, to encourage the government to still follow the processes within the constitution, for instance, any reform, for instance, the, any ban, the labor bill, uh, the labor bill that was introduced last year, the recent um, uh, import ban, and all these things have to follow proper procedure, they have to go to their people, so that while there is an introduction of these new things, there is an engagement of the masses, so that there is, so that we have pro-people, uh, pro-masses, um, policies rather than to, cont to be seen continuously kind of promoting the exclusion that had been there in Zimbabwe. And I'll end with, uh, for all of us who are here to say, I know we are representing the international community. I know we are representing the, um, the, our organizations. But I do know that in, in the United States, for instance, the majority of the funding comes from individuals. And I'm, I just want to say, to appeal to the individuals here to say, yes, you work for an organization. But there are certain things that you could do as an individual that could change or assist the organizations that you're already working with. I know to, here at NET, there's a certain lady who has been assisting um, a community where she comes from in her own spare time, helping them fundraising. Those are some of the things, the little things that we could do. But I, I have here just to say, volunteer your skill sets. Sometimes, as a as a as a international uh, 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 as an international person who's working internationally, you it's easy to just say, well, um, um, I'm working with my organization, but there are skill sets that, are, that could increase women's participation. We're talking about women's organizations not being well-funded. Most Part of it could be actually the issues of capacity. So if you extended your capacity to organizations like Tali, in your own individual way, when you come to the community, it would go a long way in making the organization competent to receive more funding for their work, and then just to provide advice and expertise and, and encourage relationships whereby when we're doing a monitoring evaluation is more about partnerships and developing each other and learning in the processes when we are, um, when we are doing our work. And then 
You could donate, for instance, Tally, we are running, we recently did, uh, started an online crowdfund uh, fundraising, so you could do something right away that you could, if you think about, or you could sign up either way to any organization that you care about. Now, in my conclusion remarks, I just want to comment and say that it is a smart decision for Zimbabweans and the international community to invest in girls young women in leadership development by channeling resources towards their early civic um, engagement. The world needs to change from pouring large amounts of money and resources into elections and conflict, but to begin to invest more in community transformation where young, where young people and women are empowered with democratic values to engage within their, their families, communities, and nation, to hold their leaders accountable to be more assertive regarding their rights, addressing the prior mentioned barriers to participate for girls and young women, and implementing some of the recommendations, including holding Zimbabwe's public officials accountable will ensure efficient utilization of resources. This will advance human rights, service delivery, and participation of girls and young women in Zimbabwe. Thank you all. Uh, Thank you all for your interest in investing in Zimbabwe. It is commendable. Thanks. Thank you, Niari, for your very all-encompassing, engaging, and inclusive remarks inviting us to join with you in stating the mission of TALI. Let us now turn over to Natalie Kay, who will share with us her remarks, followed by a brief Q&A. Thank you, Xerxes. And thank you to the forum for giving me this opportunity to comment on Niarazzo, or Niari as we call her, um, excellent presentation. Um, I think you did a really good job outlining for us the barriers to participation and empowerment for women in Zimbabwe and how they can be overcome by investing in women and um, pushing for more democratic governance. And I also want to commend your work with TALI, your organization, and for reminding us that to achieve a society of empowered women, we have to start with girls. So congratulations on your presentation. Um, I want to start by giving a brief summary of the situation unfolding in Zimbabwe right now that Nyari has given us a brief glimpse of. Um, I'll then speak about NED's commitment to supporting civil society and women's rights in Zimbabwe. And then I'll expand on some of her recommendations based on my own observations working closely with our partners in the country. As Nyari mentioned, um, Zimbabweans have been protesting throughout the country this week. And this could be a pivotal moment in Zimbabwe's history. So I'm really glad that we're having this event today that will give us an opportunity to discuss um, the implications of that for women and how we can make sure that the government is accountable to its citizens during this important time. So Zimbabweans are protesting because they aren't receiving their salaries. They're protesting police brutality and corruption. They're protesting economic policies that prevent them from buying and selling their goods. The unemployment rate is at almost 90% or possibly even higher, and the government and banks are running out of cash. They're about to begin printing bond notes, which, as Nyari mentions, many are scaring a lot of people because they're remembering what happened with the inflation in 2007 and 2008. What's different this time is that the government is also undergoing a political crisis at the same time. President Mugabe is 92 years old and is now being criticized by even his own former allies for refusing to clarify a succession plan or to budge from the party's defining policies that have ultimately failed. The party may now lack the unity to control the narrative from the economic fallout or to employ the security forces as effectively as it has in the past. The public unrest happening now has been unusual for Zimbabweans who have in recent years kept quiet due to fears of politically motivated violence. And while this development could signal a promising trend for citizen engagement, it could also lead to chaos and violent crackdowns. Meanwhile, the IMF and other international actors have agreed to relieve $1.8 billion of Zimbabwe's debt 
and are now negotiating with the government to introduce new loans with conditions that, as Nyari stressed, we should be paying very close attention to. Nyari shared how this crisis affects women when she discussed the exclusion that occurs when a government is not responsive to the majority of its citizens and the economic hardships that disproportionately affect women. These barriers will, will obviously only become harder to surmount as this crisis deepens and highlights the need for an even greater investment in women. To give a quick overview of NED's involvement in Zimbabwe, we're currently supporting 20 civil society organizations throughout the country, and it's one of our top priority countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Over the past four years, in partnership with our grantees on the ground and with our US-based core institutes, we've held a series of high-level conferences um, that have successfully brought together Zimbabwe's government officials, political parties with US and other foreign governments, labor unions, business community, the media, and civil society, including women's organizations, to come together and discuss common goals for the future of Zimbabwe. These discussions helped to reopen dialogue after the 2013 elections and have influenced the current wave of attempts by the government to re-engage with the international community. Most of our grantees are working in some way to promote the implementation of the new constitution, which contains some progressive reforms, including a greater commitment to women's rights. They're carrying out advocacy for policy reforms and empowering citizens to demand more accountable governance with a focus on those normally marginalized by politics, such as women, youth, and rural communities. The women's organizations that we currently support are all operating outside the major cities um, to engage women in activities to improve local governance, such as holding public feedback forums with elected officials or tracking local budgets. That these initiatives are led by women serves the dual purpose of empowering the women within their communities as well as challenging their local authorities to become more responsive to the interests and ideas of half of their constituents. And this is a point that Nyari presented as one of her reasons to invest in girls and women, the idea that more inclusive participation will lead to better governance. But what about when spaces to participate don't exist? Nyari, something you could further explore in your final research product um, could be an analysis of local government structures um, under the section on barriers of bad governance and corruption, I believe. Participating in local governance processes is a more tangible way for women to improve their communities and their lives, especially in a country where citizens have lost faith in elections as a conduit of change. But the problem is not just that women aren't interested in participating, it's also that the space for them to contribute does not exist in a meaningful way. There is little political will for the government to actually implement the new constitution's call for devolution. So even if elected local councillors are, are open to listening to their constituents, they often lack the power or expertise to actually address their concerns. So I would explore how can this challenge be overcome and what can, what can ordinary citizens do to strengthen these structures. Many civil society organizations have rightly recognized that local government reform is key to a truly representative democracy in Zimbabwe and have incorporated this into their advocacy efforts. But how else can civil society respond? In Yari's presentation, she urged civil society to include more women at the table. In addition to not including enough women or young people in their internal decision making, some civil society actors have been accused of falling into the same traps of those in government and opposition parties such as getting distracted by political drama, giving into corrupt practices, becoming too complacent, or losing touch with the grassroots. It's true that civil society experienced a bit of an identity crisis following the 2013 elections, which forced them to re-examine their role and connections in politics and society. But they've since regrouped, and in the context of the economic crisis, they're shifting the focus of their programming to socioeconomic rights such as healthcare and basic public services. And they're creating a link for citizens between these issues and instances of government corruption, such as the, quote, missing $15 billion, which is probably more than 15 billion. Um, this approach helps citizens who may be disillusioned with politics to realize that their everyday concerns can and should be addressed by exercising their political and civic rights. And it has also empowered women Challenges like not being able to pay school fees or care for the children or having to walk too far to find clean water uh, especially resonate with women. 
And programming around these issues pours, pulls more women into the conversation and empowers them to seek out opportunities to participate in civic action and decision making. On more than one occasion when I've attended one of our grantees' uh, activities focusing on these issues, um, the grantee has pointed out somewhere in the room an undercover female police officer who's presumably there to take notes and report back to the government on the activities. In one such instance, um, once the woman realized that the meeting did not in fact have a radical political agenda, she became very interested in the discussion topics, being a woman herself. And by the end, she was participating in the exercises, asking relevant questions, and even singing along to lyrics promoting women's solidarity. So this, this kind of thing really solidifies for me the potential of these programs to unify women across political divides. I'll now turn to expanding on a few of Nyari's recommendations for donors from my perspective. I agree with her call for donors to remain flexible in the current environment, and I share her worry about the sudden shortage of funding for civil society. In Zimbabwe, civil society is more restricted in rural areas, where those with foreign funding are often harassed and accused of carrying out initiatives on behalf of the West to promote, quote, regime change. Donors should understand this context and be aware that visiting project activities in some communities can put organizations at risk and accept alternate methods of monitoring when possible. They should also allow organizations more flexibility at a time like this when the crisis is unfolding pretty rapidly because priorities will shift and civil society space will most likely shrink further. Another concern is that amid other global crises, many donors have seen their own budgets cut or have shifted focus towards encouraging Zimbabwe's international re-engagement. Many donors are taking a wait and see approach because they fear their funds may go to waste as long as the current political climate remains the same. This has already been damaging to civil society. They need support now more than ever to help channel the frustrations that citizens are feeling during this crisis into a peaceful, coordinated call for reforms and to demand a seat at the table to represent citizen voices in any future political transition. And finally, the most obvious recommendation that still needs to be reemphasized is to fund more women-led organizations. It directly empowers women, it sets positive examples for girls, and it ensures that women's voices are included in civil society discourse and in the future in places of power in a democratic government. Of course, it's necessary to have male allies in the movement, but there is not a lack of talented and motivated women in Zimbabwe. Let's support them. To conclude, I want to anticipate a question and leave it on the table for further comment by Nyari, if there's time. Some might ask, there's a major crisis unfolding in Zimbabwe right now. Why are we discussing women's rights today? Personally, I think we always need to push back on this notion that women's issues are soft and can be used as a less controversial side issue to get into talking about democracy in Zimbabwe or anywhere. Democracy is about responding to the needs of citizens, and women outnumber men in Zimbabwe and in most other countries in the world, for that matter. As donors, if we're committed to supporting Zimbabweans as they push for democracy, we need to make sure that half the population is represented. It's not an accident that so many barriers to women's participation are not being addressed by the government, because when women come together across political, ethnic, and other divides, they are a powerful force. Thank you, Natalie, for your insightful remarks. We now have some time for questions, and in the interest of time, and in light of our having... I will take three questions at once. Um, I would like to take my prerogative as moderator to pose the first question, but then let's turn to the audience as well. And my quick question is, Niari, about your role as a musician, advocate for human rights. Tell us more about how that fits in with your overall work, um, the role of the arts in promoting human rights and democracy in Zimbabwe. But let's take two other questions from the audience as well. Yes, and if you could introduce yourself, please. Yeah, good evening. My name is Rosemary Seguero. 
I am the president of an organization called Hope for Tomorrow. We are based here in the District of Columbia. We focus on election observation, women and young girls. Thank you so much, Nati, and thank you for the N N N NTA for your wonderful work you are doing around the world. I want to tell you that we've supported uh, as a civil society, African civil society in Washington, D.C., we are always, always concerned about where we come from. I come from. Ma'am, I'm sorry, but we have only precious few minutes. So if you could formulate your comment as a question. Yes, I'm saying thank you. So no, we are here. We stand for you just the way we stand for Mukoko when she was in prison. We struggled very, very hard. But from the organization, we hear, we look about other African countries and what they go through. So we'll talk after the event. Thank you so much. Um, yes. The gentleman behind Sally. <laughs> okay, my name is Eli Smith. I'm a fellow here. Congratulations, Nyari. I want to ask you two questions. The first is, could you, you talk about the apostolic church, the role that it is playing and um, maybe discouraging girl participation. Could you please give us more explanation on that? And then finally, um, what role were women playing in the so-called uh, Zimbabwean veterans who participated in 2000 in the destruction of the Zimbabwean economy? Thank you. Um, okay, and a third question. The gentleman in the red T-shirt. Well, I don't ask a question. I just make a quick comment or suggestion. I think if the problem you are having, you're talking about civil society for it. What? He just described and what we know in Africa, we don't need civil society to handle that. We need revolutionary societies to deal with that. So change your framework. Okay, since that wasn't a question, let's go to this gentleman here in the front, in the second row. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks very much, um, Nyari and Natalie, for your presentations. Um, my question is about. If you uh, could introduce yourself. Please. Sure, no problem. Uh, my name uh, My name is uh, Douglas Coltart, uh, and I'm a Zimbabwean based here in in, in Washington. Um, my question is about uh, the this flag campaign, uh, which uh, you know cul culminated yesterday in uh, in the mass uh, stay away, um, and specifically uh, around women's participation in it. Uh, so there was a there was a a, a techie guy. Um, who who did a, a very useful study on uh, a hashtag analysis, especially during the the, the 25 days of activism uh, that launched this flag campaign, uh, and one of the the key findings there was that uh, was that there was very low participation of women uh, in in the social media campaign. Um, now there's there's all sorts of uh, of, of explanations uh, for that, you know, structural reasons. Why women are often excluded from the conversation, but uh, my question uh, really to you is, uh, what can be done to make sure that women's voices are being uh, included specifically in in this uh, the, in the this flag citizens movement? Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so maybe we'll take one more, and then Nayari will have the floor to respond, and then we'll conclude, because we need to wrap up by 4.30. So this gentleman next to Doug Goldhart had his hand up as well. And I've taken notes, so we can... Oh, hi. Um, thank you. Um, I'm very impressed um, with your talent, and I must um, commend And your you. name, please, sir? Uh, uh, my name is Masala, and... Um, I represent um, REFSA Inc. Education Consortium. Thank now, um, what, what you said is, I mean, not new to me, coming from Africa, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, and we are very familiar with all this problem. But um, um, the question about um, women's problem, you know, men have been dominant all over the world, not only in Africa. I mean, it's, um, because of, you know, the, Culturally, only recently, you know, even in the United States, that women have. Now, my question is um, for her, um, have you considered why women in certain parts of the world are making much progress than, I mean, compared to others? For example, in the United States, in the last just 100 years, because they were in almost similar situation, 
but in the last 100 years, they have made such um, great progress. And in Africa, things are stuck in place. And one of the um, things is, I think, poverty. So can you address Thank that? Thank you very much. So a number of topics. I would invite Niari to touch upon them as quickly as possible so we can wrap up by 4.30. The role of music, the role of the apostolic church, the low participation of women in the flag campaign, and the disparity in levels of women's participation in Africa versus elsewhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, you will remind me if I left anything. Um, so, Ellie, you asked about the participation of women. Um, first of all, the Apostolic Church. The Apostolic Church is, is, is really about, um, it's a large number of Zimbabweans who belong to, uh, to this sect. And um, they often, because of their religious belief, they think that women and girls should get married early and they don't want the women and girls to go to the hospitals and of course the government of zimbabwe has been trying to uh, uh, to um to address these issues by enforcing that everybody for instance every child gets immunized and other things so it's 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 a battle that we keep fighting and we are trying to lobby the government to as much as possible enforce the law on all citizens to make sure that girls and young women are protected and then about uh, the, the role of women in 2000, you would find that it's, it's a few women will be engaged with the, um, with the rule. At, at that point, it was more like the ruling party was the one implementing this. So you'd find those who are amongst the ruling party. But you'd find that most of the violence or whatever that was going on is implemented by the men because the young people, especially the young men. So that's why it's important for us to engage young men and young women at a younger age to make sure that they know and should be able to reason and to refuse to engage in certain things that are destructive. And then there was the issue of um, the flag campaign and women's participation. I'll tell you that one thing that I've learned when this was happening is that even the women who are working within the movement themselves need, they, they are still, we, we still need a personal revolution. Because I remember texting in one of my groups where women were in, on a WhatsApp group and say, guys, do you see what's happening? We need to be part of it. And so people, naturally, many women would take back seats. And because also the things of fear to say, if I'm part of this, am I going to be followed? So you'd find that some, sometimes people just decide to be safe and not to be seen because being online can also expose you and make you vulnerable. So it's the fear and also the fact that, so I, I would say it's a combination of factors there. And then uh, what we can do is just to continue engaging women, to continue actually a revolution amongst a revolution ourselves as young women to say, what, what can we do even as, because I realized that I was called a young woman, but I'm also at a place where now I'm no longer a young woman, but I have young women that I need to carry with to create a, a, a revolution amongst ourselves, the young graduates, the, are people that we need to carry with and create a new revolution as well. Um, and then um, the issue of, It's, 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 it's a question of, I, I think I presented about it when I was talking about how the, polit the political and economic instability gives a backlash. It's a natural backlash. When the country, when there's a lot of corruption and looting and things are going on, um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's across the board. When we, it's not just about women not participating. The health facilities are bad, in bad shape right now.